right, uh, good afternoon everyone. My name is Sam. I'm a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon, and I'll be sharing with you a little bit of our, uh, the work that I've been doing with my advisors on investigating sort of the impacts that uh, climate change and population growth might have on metropolitan greenhouse gas emissions. So the main motivation for this is uh, sort of these two figures, which I'm sure everyone's already seen, but uh, you know, our, uh, our understanding and concern with climate change has been growing over time. And um, this is particularly, I think, important in the context of cities. Uh, so when you're looking at um, projected temperature changes, cities are really going to have to start worrying about um, protecting you know, vulnerable citizens from extreme heat events or things like that. Uh, and then on the other hand, um, when you're looking at uh, change, projected changes in precipitation, uh, some cities are going to start to start even to think about you know, how do they ensure that they have enough water supply to support their populations, particularly the populations that are uh, growing. Uh, and on the other hand, in places like Pittsburgh, you might have to start worrying about having too much water or exacerbating sort of already concerning issues such as uh, combines or overflows. And so, to start addressing some of these challenges, cities have developed, uh, you know, increasingly been developing climate action plans. Uh, these can take a variety of different forms, but uh, a lot of them entail uh, developing a greenhouse gas emission reduction target. And so, uh, don't worry about reading any of the slides, this is kind of a snapshot of uh, a summary document from ICLE. Um, so these are like 50 of uh, close to 200 cities that have developed different uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets. And um, some cities are already on sort of their third iteration of their targets. Um, so on the one end, we have cities pledging like 4% reduction by 2012. And uh, so they're kind of they're happy with that. And then on the other end, you have cities like Seattle, which are uh, much more aggressive and uh, optimistic, I guess, in their, in their abilities. And so they've kind of pledged 80% reduction by 2050. But kind of on average, most of these cities are about 30% reduction by the year 2030. So you can kind of keep that in mind. Um, so in kind of thinking more about these climate action plans and these uh, emission reduction targets, there's a few things that we call exogenous factors that um, aren't always captured very well in sort of the first the development of the targets and also the sort of implement, implementation of reduction strategies. And so uh, the three ones that we kind of focus our work on are climate change, um, and so more specifically, how well changing temperatures uh, impact uh, demand for electricity, and then how that subsequent demand for increase or change in uh, demand for electricity impact emissions. Um, so usually people look at sort of, you know, uh, electricity causing greenhouse gas emissions, and we're kind of circling it back around to how will temperature changes potentially uh, lead to increased emissions. Um, population change. Uh, 50 of the metropolitan areas in the United States are uh, projected to have at least a 30% increase in their population, looking at kind of the time period from the year 2000 to the year 2030. Um, and so if you're trying to reduce your emissions by 30% by 2030, but your population is also growing at a rate of 30%, then that can make things very challenging. Um, and then finally, there's going to be sort of these technology and policy developments that are a little bit harder to predict and a little more uncertain, but uh, we're pretty focus at least on a couple that are uh, a little bit easier to grasp, and in particular the sort of new EPA regulations on uh, power plant emissions. So kind of rolling all this up together, uh, our sort of general research question that we're exploring is how do projections in climate change, population, and policy impact metropolitan electricity use and the subsequent greenhouse gas emissions? Um, and then kind of splitting it further, uh, first, We'll be looking at what is the uh, impact of projected temperature increases on metropolitan electricity use and emissions. And then, um, so this will be kind of the main focus of what I'll be talking about. And then I'll touch a little bit about, a little bit on uh, the impacts of population growth and then sort of policy or technology changes. Okay, so uh, to understand, you know, how climate change might impact electricity use and their emissions, 
the first thing we want to do is get a good kind of baseline understanding of how this uh, temperature and electricity demand interact with each other. And so uh, we're just kind of studying these three uh, regions within Texas. So this is um, a picture of sort of ERCOT, which is the uh, trade manager in Texas, and they split their network into these subregions. And so we explore uh, sort of these regions which coincide with the biggest metropolitan areas in Texas. So we have Houston, kind of down here in the southeast, Austin and San Antonio in the middle, and then Dallas and Fort Worth uh, kind of in the middle of the center. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is sort of come up with a uh, electricity demand versus temperature profile, which I'll show in the next. So this first one is for the San Antonio and Austin region, or the South Central region on that previous graph. And on the y-axis we have daily electricity load, uh, and on the x-axis we have average daily temperature. So the average daily temperature is just the mean of the minimum and maximum temperature for the rainy day. Uh, all this data is for the year 2012. The electricity data comes straight from ERCOT, so they have all the way uh, available um, uh, hourly generation uh, data, and so we put that, and then the temperature data is from NOAA. So, so we can combine these to get uh, the sort of 365-point uh, data set, which is sort of a, a each day in 2012, and then add a trend line to see that there's a nice uh, sort of parabolic relationship between uh, load and temperature. And so we'll use this uh, sort of trend line equation moving forward when we want to then investigate uh, how might the electricity demand change when the temperature changes. So moving to Dallas, it's a similar similar picture. The axes are uh, all the same and you get very similar shape. Um, it's just slightly shifted up just because there's a larger total demand in the Dallas area compared to the San Antonio Moss area. And then finally we have Houston. Uh, which again, same axes, um, similar shape, but there's kind of a more of a shift towards hotter temperatures, which is just kind of due to Houston being slightly warmer uh, on average than, um, than uh, Dallas and San Antonio and Austin. Uh, but so we have these three relationships, and, um, and so we're kind of using those moving forward when we're, when we're projecting forward to see what the impacts of climate change might be. Um, and then just kind of uh, for reference, I color coded based on the city. So Houston is orange throughout the uh, talk. Uh, San Antonio, Austin are red, and Dallas is. Okay, so we have our baseline. Um, next is uh, kind of the trickier part is we need to figure out how my temperatures change uh, moving forward. And to do this, we use uh, statistically downscaled data from uh, two different climate models. From the geophysical fluids that fluid dynamics lab uh, out of NOAA. Um, and so I'll just, just kind of give you a frame of reference. I'll show you three maps showing uh, kind of where our uh, temperature projections are, are coming from. So, first is the sort of San Antonio Austin region. So, uh, we get uh, spatially averaged uh, temperature projections for the box, the red box area. Um, average over time for the years 2025 to 2035. Um, generally for Dallas, uh, trying to kind of correspond with the ERCOT region that I showed in the previous graph, or previous map earlier in the talk. Um, and then finally, uh, the Houston area. So we had to kind of shrink it down a little bit just to make sure we weren't getting um, temperature readings from the uh, so just to kind of pause and, and give a little bit more of, uh, of some explanation on the models that we used. Uh, every few years, the IPCC uh, compiles these sort of these model comparisons for the different climate models that are available out there. Um, and this figure kind of just is a color, nice figure, the color coded figure that they developed to just kind of show the relative error of the different models for different measurements. Um, and in particular, this one showing uh, temperature at the surface, which is what TAS stands for. And sort of the, the lighter colors indicate a smaller relative error, and the darker colors indicate a larger relative error. And so these are the two models that uh, we end up using for this study. Um, 
they're both uh, they're kind of on the lower end of the air, but they're kind of straddle zero, so we're hoping that that goes down um, all the possibilities. Um, and uh, so yeah, hopefully that a little bit clearer picture. Uh, we have many choices, but just to kind of start off with, we, we uh, decided to go with those two channels. So what does that get us? Um, so this graph shows sort of historical observed temperatures and the projected future temperatures. Uh, so we have on the y-axis the average daily temperature for a given day, and then the x-axis is the day of the year, one through 365. And each point uh, on here represents sort of an average uh, over a decadal period. So on the dotted um, figure, which is the lower one, those are the historical observed data points. Um, and so, so, for example, this first data point would be the average daily temperature for January 1st, uh, average over the 10 years from 1990 to 1999. Uh, similarly, the top figure is the projected uh, temperature values, um, and those are averaged over uh, the, the decadal period of 2025 to 2035. And again, you would get sort of, uh, so for January 1st, you would have 10 uh, projected temperature values, and then uh, one for each year, and then we take an average to get sort of the one uh, point here, and do that for the whole year. Um, lost my uh, animation, but lost it. Anyways, uh, so uh, we did this. This is just for San Antonio. There's the figures for Dallas and Houston look similar. Um, and overall, if you sort of uh, take the sort of total um, change in uh, Temperatures from San Antonio, there's a 12, roughly a 12% increase for the whole year, and uh, for Dallas and Houston, it's roughly a 5% change. Um, I think that'll show more. So we have our projected temperatures, and we plug those back into our trend line equation from before, and that helps us determine how might the electricity demand change uh, roughly by the year 2035. And so on the y axis, we have total daily generation in megawatt hours, and then x-axis again is um, days of the year. Uh, the red are San Antonio and Austin, where the dotted lines are sort of the historical observed uh, daily generation, and then the solid lines are the projected uh, increase uh, due to climate change. Um, uh, orange is Houston, and blue is Dallas. Uh, sorry, this is a little bit. Okay, so um, if you sort of sum up the total generation over the years for each of these regions, uh, San Antonio and Austin are expected to undergo roughly a 12% increase, uh, while Dallas and Houston are expected to undergo roughly a 5% increase. <laughs> but as I mentioned, uh, kind of way back in the beginning, uh, climate is only one of the factors that is likely to change. We also have things like uh, population growth and then sort of new EPA regulations. So we are now kind of uh, starting to add those into the analysis and, and see how everything kind of shakes out. So this is sort of some preliminary results from that work. Um, and so kind of what this is showing is a percentage change between uh, 2010 and 2030. For, uh, for these different factors for San Antonio and Austin. And so uh, they're both uh, estimated or projected to undergo at least a 30% increase in population, which uh, one could imply that would lead to an increase in emissions uh, in the absence of drastic efficiency measures. Uh, but on the other hand, there's sort of this counteracting measure of the uh, EPA's new regulations in which uh, power plants are kind of required to meet a certain threshold for their average emissions per megawatt hour. And um, San Antonio, the San Antonio area kind of has a dirtier grade compared to Austin, and so they'll have to, uh, they'll actually have a larger reduction due to these EPA regulations compared to Austin. And so when you kind of roll all these, all these together, uh, so you have the roughly 12% increase in demand due to climate change, the uh, increase from populations, and the decrease from the EPA regulations. Uh, 
Uh, San Antonio's electricity emissions are expected to have a net reduction of roughly 40% by the year 2030, but Austin, on the other hand, is expected to have a net increase in electricity-related emissions by the year 2030. Um, so kind of going in opposite directions. So just to kind of wrap things up a little bit, uh, climate change will likely lead to increased electricity demand in Texas metropolitan areas. <laughs> Uh, the magnitude of the change, however, is dependent on location. So, an area where San, in San, like San Antonio and Austin, where there's um, sort of sustained increases in temperature throughout the year, we'll see a higher increase as opposed to uh, Dallas, which has a little bit colder winters. There's sort of a trade off between uh, reduced electricity demand in the winter and increased demand in the summer. So, in the net, you don't quite get as big of an increase in demand. Uh, it appears that changes in population and emission intensity are at least as, impact, at least as impactful as changes in temperature. Uh, and in kind of the, the quick example that I just discussed, it looks like those are probably more uh, impactful than uh, changes in temperature. Um, we believe that decision makers could use this approach to uh, kind of better inform the establishment of their mitigation targets moving forward. Um, so by kind of being able to incorporate some of these exogenous factors, or, uh, particularly kind of factors that look uh, into the future a little bit, um, they can better shape their targets to kind of meet the needs of their, their cities. And then they can also use this approach to uh, prioritize their mitigation strategies. So we saw San Antonio was, was uh, expected to have a net decrease in emissions from electricity, and so the decision makers there might want to focus their mitigation efforts more on the transportation side of things, uh, whereas Austin, where uh, a net increase in emissions from electricity is expected, they might, might want to prioritize their efforts on uh, residential commercial building energy efficiency and things like that. And then uh, moving forward, we are working on expanding the analysis to uh, other metropolitan areas, so um, Texas is sort of Although the climate varies within Texas, it's, it's, it doesn't vary quite as much, uh, you know, as it could, you know, if you're comparing Texas to a place like Pennsylvania, um, particularly areas where uh, heating demand is a much bigger portion of the uh, energy consumption. Um, and so we're we're hoping to sort of be able to investigate some of those trade-offs when you're kind of offsetting uh, heating demand and cooling demand and seeing how that impacts emissions. Uh, incorporate more climate projections just to make sure that we're kind of fully capturing the uncertainty with the climate models. Um, incorporating impacts of non-electricity heating and cooling. So we only looked at electricity here, uh, but you know a lot of heating at least is is, is done um, with natural gas, and so we want to explore that a little bit. And then uh, look at sort of uh, marginal emission factors in addition to the average emission factors that we use here, um, just because. You kind of remember back to the graph, a lot of the increase in demand is coming from kind of these peak summer events, and so um, that's likely to be sort of more marginal emission rather than sort of the average emission factor that we uh, use. Um, with that, I'd like to thank my, uh, my funding uh, from the US, uh, it was the Steinbrenner Institute and the Qualcomm Foundation, and then the uh, input and support from uh, some, some fellow colleagues and office mates. Glad to be here. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you took a look at how changing the time resolution down to an hour of the time resolution would change the relationship between temperature and flow. Do you see a similar trend between the two if you use your time resolution? I don't have an intuition for what that might look like. I think at least, I think that's maybe. Part of the motivation why we wanted to sort of maybe look at some of the marginal emissions factors in addition to the average, because it's, it's likely when you're in these sort of events, you're having sort of the, the worst emitters being called online. Um, and I, ideally, we would be able to get it down to the hourly level, but we don't really have the climate projection data at the hourly level. And so uh, maybe we could just use some statistical modifications to try and, to try and investigate that. but. Given this sort of uncertainty already around the climate models, I don't know how. Right, I think that would be 
It's interesting facet of looking at the market, mm-hmm. and I think that would be important. Mm-hmm. The market momentum is very pretty great right. throughout the day. Right. And I think, yeah, especially like for in addition to greenhouse gases, I think when you're looking at the north criteria for as well, that can have a huge impact. So, yeah. Um, yeah. You were talking mostly about the overall energy load for the city, and then you were talking about population and how it would protect the growth. So I was just wondering how you were able to uh, use the load of population to. Sure. So um, the population projection numbers were provided by the state. So they have county level uh, estimates for, for each county. And so uh, we lump the counties into the metropolitan statistical areas. And then, um, so yeah, we have the total electricity demand for those, each of those regions in Texas, and then sort of allocated those on a, or sort of did that in a, turn that into a per capita basis instead of a total uh, basis, and then multiply the projected change population by the baseline per capita basis to see how it might change. I should have spent a little more time on that. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was just wondering if there might be some like big industrial um, layers that wouldn't grow the same. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. Um, so the the data source that we're using for the underlying emissions data is, is kind of based on the National Emissions Inventory and the, the Greenhouse Gas uh, Mandatory Reporting Program. A little bit on e-grid, so they typically separate industrial, uh, the industrial sector from some of the electricity sector, and so there's no there's no guarantee that that captures everything. But I think a lot of that concern would be already addressed just by then sort of uh, initially separating the sectors. Great, thanks. It's very much a conjecture question. <laughs> um, as you were giving your talk, which I really enjoyed, uh, the thing that I kept thinking about is you know, any large city in the government structure. And utilities must know that population will increase and demand will increase. And aside from you know, trying to make sure that greenhouse gases are not emitted to unhealthy levels, there must also be even greater concern about how we supply electricity mm-hmm. to the population mm-hmm. that's needing it. Um, so, with that innovation that has to happen, um, are there innovating technologies in reducing those greenhouse gases? So, are you aware of any? Your utility or government programs to accommodate this change in population, and, and if you are aware of them, what, what are the ones? Um, nothing in particular, but I can I guess it's conjecture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah make it up, right? So uh, I've seen there are, have been some other studies, like in focus on California in particular, and they did sort of a similar approach where you kind of do this do this trend line. Um, to get kind of the baseline relationship between temperature and demand, and then you project that forward using climate models. Uh, and they were focused specifically on uh, sort of determining the extra capacity and electricity that would be needed. So I was actually starting to look at like, do we need to start building more plants just to uh, meet this sort of increased demand? Um, and getting to Jeremiah's question a little bit, that kind of starts hitting on the margins a little bit. And so I think that's really where sort of residential commercial efficiency can come in, um, real time pricing. People think maybe it'll help sort of really, it's all about just trying to shade the load as much as possible um, in order to hopefully avoid having to build a whole new you know, set of infrastructure in plants to meet these demands. And then if that can't be avoided, I think it's, then that's where sort of the EPA law comes in. Where you can't just build a coal plant anymore, you have to build an inefficient natural gas plant, you have to start going to more state of the art, more efficient plants that, that at least have a better emissions factor than what we are kind of slightly sitting here. Uh, your uh, electricity consumption versus temperature is mm-hmm. very useful. Uh, actually, the earlier question I've been thinking uh, you you created a unique curve for each of these cities, mm-hmm. uh, but have you considered converting this putting it all on a per capita basis to see how they overlay? Are there actually different behaviors between those cities, or uh, would, it, would it be possible to have a more general model that fit a per capita mm-hmm. basis, which then could actually directly incorporate uh, population change? Yeah, actually, that, 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 
Not yet. I would actually, we're kind of hopefully moving in that direction and would like to be able to do that. The problem is, so far, we don't have a good idea of exactly how many people live in these streets. So like, these don't necessarily, these are kind of arbitrarily chosen by ERCOT. And so um, hopefully we'll be able to kind of get in touch with them and, and then get a better idea of exactly where are these boundaries and then be able to estimate within that. I mean, uh, done some kind of initial calculations with like a lot of the load in this, for example, the South Central region, uh, close to 80% of the load comes from just sort of the San Antonio and Austin metropolitan areas. So at least in terms of load and you can sort of loosely tie that to population, I think a lot of it would be captured by the major cities, but as far as getting a good sort of per capita estimate, don't quite have that yet. But hopefully we'll be able to in the back of the Similar to the gentleman's question, I talked about hourly data, mm -hmm. and I, I agree completely. Going to hourly data in a, in a 50 year ahead projection mm -hmm. is, is a really different thing as far as measuring the calipers on how you do the But what about just temperature swing data? One of my concerns, mm -hmm. especially in projected data, is it's not just the mean temperature. But there, there are already days in Dallas where you heat and cool on the same day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That probably is not an increasing trend. Okay. And the average wouldn't catch that. Right. Okay. But the, 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 the temperature swing data at high level. That's a good point. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've been looking at So I have sort of the, the baseline data I have as sort of projected minimum and maximum temperatures. So, uh, I, I could probably just develop similar curves, but only looking at the maximums and the minimum curves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Have you looked at all urban heat islands? No, I, yeah, that's like another thing that I really yeah. want to look into. Especially when you're comparing cities, um, you know, you sort of get an estimate of what the surface temperature might be, but the actual temperature could be, you know, 10 degrees hotter, I'm especially in Houston and Dallas. Like, yeah. That would drive your energy usage uh -huh. in the near term a lot more than climate change. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. changes on that front. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, I don't know, like, I, I sort of did a quick search, I, if I need to spend more time, but, like, I was hoping there was sort of even just a general engineering factor you could apply based on density or something like that, like estimate for urban heat island in a given area, but I wasn't able to come across that. But yeah, it's, that's, that's something that's been in the back of my mind. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you. Oh, I'd just like to mention that we're doing this kind of a complementary study at ASU. Actually, it's already been done. Okay. Where um, we found that gener electricity generation is the capacity is reduced with increasing temperature. So as we're getting increased demand, as you're showing, mm -hmm. we're also getting a decreased capacity to produce electricity, mm -hmm. okay. which makes the problem a little more challenging. So the, the, what they call it the reserve factors, you know, is that kind of what you're talking about? Um, maybe. Okay, yeah. <laughs> the reserve factor is smaller. Yeah. Yeah. The patterns seem to be coming up across questions, if I'm hearing them right is that there's these sort of feedbacks that happen in temperature mm -hmm. that are distinct to urban dynamics. And the, like, it seems like you hit some of them and people are pulling up other ones. Mm -hmm. The question is like pulling back, what are the key feedbacks that will make this different than the linear projections that we sort of can generate through gross data? Does that make sense? Uh, what do you mean by linear project? Just sort of like linear population projections and things like that? Right, we're working off of something. Even if it's not linear, even if you're getting okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 it's a first yeah. order analysis mm -hmm. of one implant for a variable. And then, are there, granted, you've taken the second order, you've got an R factor, an R squared of 93, 94, 94 yeah. yeah. But does that change over time as more systems dynamics kick in? Mm -hmm. Do you have some feedback loops from urban island and from X, from Y? Which is in a so, time for you. At least for urban island, I don't know if the shape of the curve would change. I think maybe sort of the just sort of the temperatures would just be shifted up or shifted to the right a little bit. So actually, you, you maybe end up more on the right side of the curve more often than you're in the middle or on the left side. Um, and so I don't know. Yeah, I'd have to, yeah, I'd have to the, think about that. The, the feedback loop I can see happening mm -hmm. with the um, generation capacity. Challenges. You're running your efficient gas generation 
it might have to curtail because you would have enough of a, of a heat sink from your reservoir for a high temperature and heat drought. Mm -hmm. so then you have to run actually your more expensive, less efficient coal plant, which you only usually run in the hottest two days in August. Mm -hmm. But now you have to run that through all of July and August because your main plant has faster risk curtail. Mm -hmm. And then that will continue okay. to snowball. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> you really, yeah. And how do you write the infinite number of scenarios? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, Leon will have 10 years left from here. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? I have a couple of Sure. <laughs> Since you have all the time. Yeah, no problem. Uh, also, this, this is a, another conjecture. Mm -hmm. This is a thinking of this. Okay? This is Texas. Mm -hmm. They will do a similar study in a developing country for the population trends in the so within the 10 year time we're looking at the buying capacity and the standard living which is a dramatic So why do you guess how would those studies be over the um, So yeah, no, I, I think, I think uh, in that sense well, there's a couple ways to answer that. I guess, and if you're just worried about greenhouse gas emissions, um, I feel like the sort of temperature change component would maybe not be as important as the population change or the sort of increase in affluence component. Um, as Adriana has kind of talked, spoke about, as you said, yeah, you know, your housing situation taken care of, then you move to wanting a car, and then you kind of move out more to the suburbs. And so I think. Uh, those components would start, I think, being a lot more important in terms of overall emissions profile and sort of, uh, the temperature versus electricity component. Uh, there might also be some good opportunities, though, since the infrastructure is newer there, they could immediately anticipate um, these temperature impacts and, you know, making sure that their sort of marginal grid or their grid as a whole is maybe cleaner than what we're seeing in the United States or putting more emphasis on you know, uh, distributed generation, renewable uh, power, things like that. Any other questions?